Hello, and welcome to Trust Radio, the investment trust podcast hosted by Janus Centers and Investors, where we take a deep dive into the questions investors really want to know the answers to. My name is Andrew Chaguri, and today I'm joined by David Smith to discuss factors currently affecting the UK market and how consumers and businesses are dealing with some of these challenges and how he, as an investor and portfolio manager, is navigating some of these challenges. David also touches on the outlook for UK dividends over the coming months. David, welcome to the show. Thank you. So David, it's been a tough start for global equity markets. Supply chain disruptions have led to high inflation and that was exacerbated by the war in Ukraine. Now, all of this has also raised the expectations of faster than expected interest rate hikes from central banks. How are you navigating this market environment and what have been the key drivers or detractors from performance? So it's quite interesting. The UK market has actually been, at a headline level, actually fairly resilient in the um, in the increased volatility across global markets. So the FTSE all share uh, was actually in positive territory towards the end of, by year to date to the end of uh, of May. But I think below the surface, there's been, there's been huge volatility in about sector leadership within the UK. So you know, the likes of oil and gas sector, the likes of mining done very well. So um, up over 40 and up over 30 percent respectively, you know, driven by strong, you know, strong underlying commodity prices caused by, you know, to a certain extent, the, the, the war in, in Ukraine and Russia. Um, also, some of the more sort of traditional defensive sectors, be it uh, tobacco, utilities, pharmaceutical companies, they've also performed pretty robustly as well. On the flip side of that, you've seen cyclical companies, you know, those most exposed to the economic cycle, sell off quite aggressively. Likes of industrials, likes of retailers, uh, likes of house builders, etc. Uh, those have come back down. So in that context, uh, actually, again, the sort of the NAV of the trust has actually been fairly resilient. So the NAV is up uh, 0.8% uh, for the year to the end of May, which has outperformed the, um, the slight fall in our benchmark as well. So sort Again, a, glo- a volatile global index has actually been pretty, pretty stable, pretty resilient so far. With volatility, which is something that you touched on uh, in your previous answer, now entrenched within markets, is the portfolio more defensively positioned now? Given our income bias, we generally have an exposure more to sort of stable uh, businesses that can pay a good dividend and grow into the future. So we always have uh, a typically more bias towards defensive companies. So I think when we came into this year, we were probably more positioned defensively. Um, I think the, the the question from here is, should we move that, that defensiveness more towards uh, cyclicality? Just because actually within the market, given the sell-off we've seen in the, the FTSE 250 and some of those cyclical sectors, actually some of those opportunities are, are starting to, 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 to come on our list, basically. You know, some good quality, albeit cyclical businesses, starting to look, look, a, look a bit more better value. Now, you know, with everyone starting to talk about recessionary risks and things like that, it's probably a little bit too early, but the market is a discounting mechanism. So, you know, at some point earnings will start to fall, but the share price will trough before the earnings do. So at some point there will be a, a, a move to be made, uh, but feels a little bit too early just yet. In such a difficult market environment, where are you finding opportunities at the moment? Are there any areas that you're divesting from or you're adding to? Uh, it's very much on a sort of stock specific basis um so one of the one of the businesses we've bought recently uh, that we like is, is devro it's makes sausage skins um it's you know it's, it's quite a um it's an unsexy business shall we say but it makes you know very good returns good margins etc you know it's sold off in line with the FTSE 250 but actually the new management team that have been there for the last three years have really got a better grip to for their operations, making it a much more streamlined business, much more operation efficiency. And there's a lot more focus now going forward about being much more commercial. It's always a very sleepy business, you know, wait for the customers to knock on our door type thing rather than actually being more commercial, thinking about how their products, you know, how to sell those products more given they do have competitive advantage in terms of some of the, uh, some of the properties that their sausage skins they make. So, you know, you know, it's a, it's a stable business, you know, food producers, it should be stable, etc. Uh, but it's sold off as people worry about energy costs, etc. things like that. Um, but I think returns can improve. Um, it pays a you know, healthy dividend yield for us as well. Um, and I think it's just undervalued in the market currently, especially versus both basically its history, but also where some of its competitors trade, its European peers and things like that. So let's talk about dividends. Dividends staged uh, a strong rebound in 2021. And the top 20 dividend pairs in the UK 
accounted for 76% of the FTSE 100's income over that period. Now, this raises a big risk if the dividends from these companies are unsustainable. What percentage of income did those companies generate for the portfolio last year? And how do you navigate that concentration risk? Yeah, I mean, I always try and make the point that just because the UK market is concentrated for income, you can't construct a well-diversified portfolio for your income needs. Um, those 20 stocks, you know, contribute, you know, I think less than 40% of our income. Now, you know, we, won't, we don't own all of them, so that, that helps in that regard. But, you know, being an income fund manager, you really, you know, do have to focus on the diversification of the business so you're not over on any one sector or stock because we get cases like, you know, 2020, we get huge dividend cuts and things like that. And if you're overly exposed to areas in the market that see the most pain, whether it be, you know, retailers or travel and leisures in the pandemic or banks in the global financial crisis, etc., that leaves a big gaping hole in your revenue account. And it means that, you know, not only does it hurt your capital side, it also hurts your revenue side and your ability to pay the dividends. So, you know, we are very much focused on diversifying the business. And I suppose uh, diversifying the trust, the portfolio, one of our unique features is obviously our ability to own bonds. And I think that really helps in that diversification because, you know, bond coupons are typically more resilient to equity dividends uh, in, in big drawdowns and in economic recessions, et cetera, because companies have to look after their, their bond holders more than their equity holders um, in the forward. So having that really helped us in 2020, diverse from that income, making sure that the impact on the revenue was was minimal versus the the over equity market there's other things you can do as well you know being a relatively smaller trust you know we can move about the market cap scale as well so looking at opportunities in the FTSE 250 and away from those you know mega cap areas of the market where as you say the concentration of income is, is fairly high you talked about bonds slightly there but you know your your bond exposure has been declining over the last few years what percentage of your portfolio do bonds currently represent? And what do high interest rates and inflation mean for that part of your portfolio? The bonds at the end of last year got to around about 10% of the NAV, which is historically probably near close to, if not the lowest we've ever been historically. Um, and that was really a truly reflection of where bond yields have got to, you know, close to those historic lows and where credit spreads were, you know, close to the historic tights as well. I think when you look at what the market has done so far this year, you've seen a big move higher in yields. You've been seen a big move higher in credit spreads. So actually, we've started allocating a bit of capital away from equities and back into bonds. Again, bonds are typically more resilient in downturns. So it's, a, it's about reducing the overall risk of the portfolio. Typically, where we've seen opportunities is in the US investment grade credit or you know the highest quality uh, uh, bonds out there. Um, you know We're buying bonds in the likes of Amazon, uh, AbV, the pharmaceutical company, uh, Comcast, Broadcom, you know, US uh, telecom companies, et cetera. Because actually the yields we're finding were, were got up to above 4%, you know, higher than where we are in equity yield for the UK market. So actually that, that dynamic suddenly presented itself more. So we've moved around about, we're up to about 13% in bonds. Now you're right, you know, we've got to be mindful of where interest rates go, where inflation goes, because, you know, typically the relationship is, as interest rates go up, bonds come under a bit of selling pressure. What I would point out is, you know, just like equity markets, bond markets are discounting mechanisms. So they will they will price in a forward curve. They will price in where they think uh, central banks will move interest rates onto. So I guess it's taken a view of where we think the expectation of rates moves from here. And I suppose the argument is if we do go in an environment where, you know, there is slow in economic growth, actually bond yields could could have peaked from here. I guess it all depends on, on where inflation lands and things like that. But let's not forget, you know, I have moved the portfolio from 10 to 13. That's versus 20% on our benchmark. So we are we are underweight, you know, still seeing opportunities in equity markets given when the valuation is there. But, you know, given that dynamic of bond yields, just shifting a bit of the portfolio to take that risk down. Now, consumers are facing a cost of living crisis and that has been reflected in low consumer confidence over the last few months. This will no doubt affect earnings in the short to medium term. Is it time to avoid companies that are exposed to the consumer? Uh, short answer, no. Um, I think you've always got to weigh it up against uh, the business, the underlying business and the valuation. Um, and I think where we, where we get our consumer exposure is very much in those companies that offer value to the end consumer. So a couple of examples, uh, B&M, which is a deep discount retailer, 
um, you know, good business model in terms of limiting the number of uh, products it sells. So it really has strong buying buying synergies, uh, which which th which those synergies are then passed on to the consumer by ever lower prices, which attracts more uh, more customers, and you have more purchasing synergies. Which and it becomes this uh, this uh, this virtuous circle, etc. And you become you know the low cost uh, provider, and you can compete against you know some of your weaker competitors that just could, don't have that buying power. And they have their own cost pressures and they can't maintain that low price, whereas B&M we think can. So I think that is a good business model. I think typically, historically, when you looked at the, the growth rates of the business in previous consumer downturns, actually the business did very well as consumers traded down. And I think that can happen again. And then when you compare that against the, the, the valuation of the business, um, you know, we believe the valuation is, is pretty cheap relative to maybe some of its US peers in that sort of discount retailing space. So that's, that's one example. I guess another one would be uh, Whitbread, um, which owns premium hotels. Again, I think if you look at its um, history, you know, it took a lot of market share in the previous downturn. We think it can do so this time round. Again, people trading down, but actually some of the weaker, more independent hoteliers, you know, coming under significant strain, A, through the pandemic, but B, also coming out of that, trying to find staff, having those cost pressures, they just can't compete on price. So actually, the, we, you know, we had a trading statement recently from Whitbread. Actually, get, things are going very well. You know, trading is, you know, materially higher than where we were pre-pandemic, and they're taking significant market share. So that's where we're focusing our, our consumer exposure. Now, alongside the consumers, companies have also been experiencing rising cost pressures through energy, labor and raw material costs all of them over the last year or so have been going up what are you hearing from your portfolio companies about rising costs and what are they doing to sustain margins yeah i mean it's uh, it's difficult right um both on the cost side but also the supply side where we focus you know our stocks stock picking ability is trying to find good quality companies that are either the market leader and they can actually you know go out and get those you know can get that supply so if you look at if you take tesco's as an example you know market leader supermarket in the uk you also want you also look for companies that have got good management teams you know ones that adapt to being able to you know find other cost savings across the organization whether it's operational efficiencies becoming leaner etc you know to help offset some of those energy cost bills and things like that and then thirdly it's about finding companies that have got pricing power you know, uh, the likes of Diageo, you know, having having those, you know, premium products that you can rise the price, which won't uh, impact demand per se. So you can offset those cost pressures coming through. So those are the kind of three things we're hearing. Going back to dividends, you know, what is your outlook for dividend growth in the UK? And how do you balance the need to generate income during periods of volatility or market stress? So I guess the outlook for uh, dividends in the UK market, as, as you rightly said, you know, we had a very strong rebound in, in underlying dividends up 22% last year. You know, a lot of that was driven by the mining sector and just the superior uh, dividends and special dividends we had from, from that sector. Also the banks, uh, you know, they returned to the dividend register having previously been blocked uh, by the regulator. But actually underlying dividends at headline level are only back to 2015 levels. So actually, even though, you know, the environment, there are headwinds out there, I think there's still a, a good runway of dividend growth going forward. Now, you know, our expectations is probably mid to single digit uh, dividend growth uh, from the underlying market. So I think it's a case of, you know, slowing economic growth, headwinds out there. It probably tempers that growth rather than puts it the dividend level at risk per se. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think, you know, when I go through on a sort of bottom up basis, that's the kind of dividend growth I would expect from the market and similar would be probably from the portfolio. I mean, for, you know, retail investors, this is obviously a very difficult period. So what should, you know, retail investors think about market volatility as they look for long term income generation for their portfolios? I think it, it depends on your time horizon. If you look at over the longer term, dividend yield plus dividend growth is the main contributions to total return in that longer term period. In the shorter term, you will get stocks that will re-rate, de-rate, etc. But over that longer term period, it's important that company pays that dividend and grows it into the future. So I think if you, as an investor, are willing to take a bit of short-term risk and try and cancel out some of the noise we're seeing, and buy a company that does offer an appealing yield that has good that can sustain that dividend and grow in the longer term, actually, you know, over the longer term period, you should be able to make good total returns as long as that dividend can get paid and can grow into longer term. 
Well, that's all we have time for today. David, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. And thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, rate, review, and share this with anyone you think will also find this interesting. If you want to learn more about investment trusts, we have a wealth of information available on our website, which you can find in the show notes. Important information, not for onward distribution. Before investing in an investment trust referred to in this podcast, you should satisfy yourself as to its suitability and the risks involved. You may wish to consult a financial advisor. This is a marketing communication. Please refer to the AIFMD disclosure document and the annual reports of the AIF before making any final investment decisions. Past performance does not predict future returns. The value of an investment and the income from it can fall as well as rise, and you may not get back the amount you originally invested. Tax assumptions and reliefs depend upon an investor's particular circumstances and may change if those circumstances or the law change. Nothing in this podcast is intended to or should be construed as advice. This podcast is not a recommendation to sell or purchase any investment. It does not form part of any contract for the sale or purchase of any investment. We may record telephone calls for our mutual protection to improve customer service and for the regulated record keeping purposes. Issued in the UK by Janus Henderson Investors. Janus Henderson Investors is the name under which investment products and services are provided by Janus Henderson Investors International Limited. Reg number 3594615. Janus Sanderson Investors UK Limited. Reg number 906355. Janus Sanderson Fund Management UK Limited. Reg number 2678531. Henderson Equity Partners Limited. Reg number 26. 06646, each registered in England and Wales at 201 Bishopsgate in London, EC2M 3AE, and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority, and Henderson Management S.A, reg number B22848 at 2 Rue de Bitmore, L1273 Luxembourg, and regulated by the Commission du Surveillance du Secteur Financier. Janus Henderson. Knowledge Shared and Knowledge Labs are trademarks of Janus Henderson Group PLC or one of its subsidiaries. Copyright Janus Henderson Group PLC. Cyclical Companies. Cyclical companies are companies that sell discretionary consumer items such as cars or industries highly sensitive to changes in the economy such as miners. The prices of equities and bonds issued by cyclical companies tend to be strongly affected by ups and downs in the overall economy when compared to non-cyclical companies. Credit spreads. Credit spreads are the difference in the yield of corporate bonds over equivalent government bonds. Diversification. Diversification is a way of spreading risk by mixing different asset classes in a portfolio. It is based on the assumption that the prices of different assets will behave differently in a given scenario. Assets with low correlation should provide the most diversification. Forward curve. The forward curve shows the short-term interest rate for future periods implied in the yield curve, NAV, net asset value. The NAV is the total value of a fund's assets less its liabilities. Volatility. Volatility is the rate and extent at which the price of a portfolio, security or index moves up and down. If the price swings up and down with large movements, it has high volatility. If the price moves more slowly to a less extent, it has lower volatility. Higher volatility means the higher risk of the investment. Yield. Yield is the level of income on a security typically expressed as a percentage rate. For equities, a common measure is the dividend yield, which divides recent dividend payments for each share by the share price. For a bond, 
This is calculated as the coupon payment divided by the current bond price. Annual performance representing cumulative income as a percentage. Discrete year performance highlighting the percentage change, updated quarterly, share price and net asset value. From the 31st of March 2021 to the 31st of March 2022, the share price was up 16.1%. The NAV was up 12.7%. From the 31st of March 2020 to the 31st of March 2021, the share price was up 42.7%, the NAV was up 26.8%. From the 29th of March 2019 to the 31st of March 2020, the share price was down 24.4%, the NAV was up 17.7%. From the 30th of March 2018 to the 29th of March 2019, the share price was up 3.6%, the NAV was up 8.1%. From the 31st of March 2017 to the 30th of March 2018, the share price was down 5.1% and the NAV was down 1.5%. All performance, cumulative growth and annual growth data is sourced from Morningstar.